Amen. Well, can we all remain standing for a second? Thank you, singers, musicians. I want to introduce a very special guest this, uh, this morning. Can we all stand together as we welcome our, and we give our guests a very special Toronto welcome. Our, our guest this morning is the, the author of 25 books, and they're not small books. Many of them are big books. Bi he's planted Bible schools in Asia and Africa, and now working in the Middle East, international exposer, but we're excited to have him here today with us. They're from Washington State, uh, uh, United States, and so they're familiar with a little bit of snow, so they're not too scared by what we've brought them here today. But we have Dr. Harold Eberly and his wife Linda with us this morning. So as Dr. Eberly comes to speak this morning, TICC in Toronto, can we give our biggest Toronto, Canada, welcome to Dr. Harold Eberly as he comes to minister this morning. Welcome, sir. God bless you. Thank you. Hallelujah. We are so blessed to be with you. You can find your seat. We want to tell you we are so honored to be here with you today. We've been hearing about the ministry coming from your leadership for over 35 years. But this is our first time to actually make personal contact. So we are very excited to build a relationship with you. Most of you do not know my wife and I, so... We'll tell you the basics, but I'm excited to worship with you, share the word with you, and just be here, part of this great church. My wife, Linda, down here, you'll be meeting her in a few minutes. She's going to come up here and join me about halfway through as I share the word of God. We've been married for 41 years. We've got three grown-up children, and we have been ministering for all that time, other than my wife has also been a school teacher for 15-plus years. So she retired from school teaching four years ago, and back on the road with me now full-time. Uh, last month, she was in Korea. Our next overseas trip is to Denmark, and then to Indonesia, and then back to Pakistan. So we keep moving. We love it. We've been traveling for 36 years, and we absolutely love being here in North America, especially. Um, it's fun to be worshiping with you. I'm going to talk today about relationships and I'm going to share a scripture from 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and as I do this I want to try to bring in a broader picture of relationships because we love to be aware of the different cultural experiences around the world and when you talk about relationships there's no more clear area where you have to be conscious of the cultural relationships the cultural variations um, because there's such a wide spectrum we spent 17 years going back and forth through the middle part of Africa, and there was a lot of things that we had to learn. The primary region where we worked, um, many of you are familiar with it, but a man has to give a dowry for a woman. But in the area we work, the bigger the woman, the bigger the dowry. In a part of the Kikuya tribe in northern Kenya, a big woman's worth about seven cows. But a skinny woman, you can only have to give two chickens, okay? <laughs> There's some certain things we had to learn about cultural shock. And there's one tribal group um, in northern Uganda where when a woman wants to get married, she has to take a club and she hides. And she's waiting for the man that she wants to marry walk by. And what she has to do is surprise him, jump out and knock him on the head. And only if she can knock them out are they to get married. If he stays conscious, they don't get married. But she can always give it another try. So there's a lot of different variations on relationships. Things that you wrestle with, you try to understand where people are coming from. But it's been one of the most intriguing and interesting part of our experiences in these other countries. Uh, I think my wife wants to try that one with a club but I'm trying to avoid that. So we've been married quite some time now, 40 plus years, and I want to talk from 2 Corinthians chapter 6 because the principles of relationship don't just apply to marriage, they apply to you with your children, you in the community of the saints, you with your friends, and you in your relationship with God. The principles are the same, how to have healthy relationships. And I'm going to read here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, because the Apostle Paul, when he writes here, he's talking from a biblical culture. And we value this 
in particular the Jewish culture, because God worked with the Jewish people for over a thousand years. He worked among them as they developed their culture, and we believe that he then breathed his spirit on the writers. So there are certain things that we can sharpen our own relationships, certain things that we can get more accurate by reading what he has put down on these pages for us. One of the first things that we're going to note as I read this is that this culture written in the Bible is more conscious of the heart than we in the Western world are. Now, there's many different cultures represented here, but those of you who have been raised in the Western world, you're probably aware that Western people tend to think the brain, the intellect, is the control center of our being. Biblical thought is the heart is the control center. Proverbs 4 says, from the heart flow all the issues of life. He is blessed who will diligently watch over his heart. I would like to then focus on the heart when we talk about relationships, but that's a shift for most Western people. Most Western people are focused on the mind, and they think if they get their thoughts right, then relationships will be right. But biblical thought is, no, you get your heart right, and your relationships will be right. I'm going to read here, now in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm reading from the New American Standard in verse 11. Paul says, Our mouth is spoken freely to you, O Corinthians. Our heart is open wide. You are not restrained by us, but you're restrained by your own affections. And now in like exchange, I speak as the children open wide to us. Now, I'm going to read one more verse, two more verses in a minute, but I'd like you to pick out of that the concept of Paul says, my heart is open wide. Again, this is a culture that's aware of the heart. One of the groups of people we worked with in Africa, they actually symbolized this in their relationships. And whenever you meet somebody, you would go up among this tribal people, shake hands like we normally would. You release hands, rotate your wrist, grab a hand again. So with a rotated wrist, you grab their hand again. Then as you release, you take your open hand, put it on your heart, and then swing the hand open. And that means I have nothing in my heart against you. Now, because this group of people are constantly interacting with each other that way, they are very aware of their heart toward every person they have contact with. If you put your hand over your heart, then swing it, and your hand is closed, it means we need to talk. It means that I have something against you, but I don't want it. I want to discuss it with you. Being a culture that's that aware of their heart, constantly interacting, constantly reminding each other, how am I with you? How, where's our relationship with that? They are a very tight community. And some cultures have a more awareness of culture, of community than we do in North America. So when Paul writes here, my heart is open wide, he's talking from that perspective. But I have nothing against you. I'm here. I want to pour out my heart. I want to give to you because ultimately you cannot give to people unless you have opened your heart to them. And nor can they receive what you have unless they've opened to you. And so Paul says, my heart's open wide to you, but there in verse 13, he's asking them, please open your heart to me because Paul understands if people are there with their walls up, they've got shields, they've got judgments, he knows he cannot impart what he has. And so he's asking, please, I have something to give you. I've got something to offer you, but I, I need you to open up your heart so we can have exchange, so that our time together is fruitful. We have an exchange of heart. Now, the awareness of letting down the heart. I'm going to talk about that, but now I want to read two more verses because there are two words that Paul now introduces that every person in that culture understood differently than we do today. So now as I read verse 14 and 15, and this is where we'll spend the rest of our time. Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? What harmony has Christ with Belia? And was a believer in common with an unbeliever? Now in those two verses, he mentions two characteristics of every relationship. The people who read this would have immediately identified them. They would have picked it up because they had the same culture. But most of us in this room, we read it over, we don't see that. 
In verse 14, he mentioned being bonded together. In Hebrew thought, that meant something different than the other verse that said, be in harmony with someone. Two characteristics, bonding with someone and being in harmony with someone, two different things, and Paul is encouraging them, be careful who you bond with and who you're in harmony with. Most of you have read this passage, and if you were to glance down, you would see that the rest of the verses are talking about being careful to not be too intimate with people who hate God, who worship false gods. He says that you will have problems in your life if you do that. That's the main message, but I'm not talking the main message. I'm focusing in on those two characteristics of a relationship and applying it to our relationships. So when I talk about bonding to their thoughts... Bonding was the depth of commitment when you have with a group of people or another individual. I'm bonded to this person. I'm committed. The more you go through difficulties, staying committed, the deeper the bonding is. The more years you have. But if you, like in a marriage, have worked through raising children, financial difficulties, sickness, buying a home, the more you work through and commit through a project's difficulties and joys in your life, the deeper the bonding goes. Bonding is something that grows slowly over the years. And the more price you've paid, the deeper the bonding. Harmony was something different. A good illustration is if you were to think of two of these guitars up here. Bonding could be represented by taking a rope and tying the two guitars together. The greater the bonding, the greater the tight rope, the stronger the rope holding them together. But harmony would be the tune the two guitars together so they sound good when played together. In the biblical understanding of these two words, the two characteristics of a relationship, yeah, there's bonding, there's commitment, there's people saying we will stay together no matter what. But then a whole different characteristic is are we in harmony? That harmony is really what I want to emphasize because it is a characteristic that so many Christians don't understand. They understand bonding. I'm supposed to be committed. I'm going to do this. But sometimes you'll have a marriage. They're bonded, but they haven't been in harmony for years. Harmony. So the two guitars sound good together. Harmony is the result of having two hearts oriented in the same direction. Whenever you take your heart and orient in the same direction as another person's heart. The Greek word that's translated as harmony here is symphonia. We get our word symphony from it. Are two people in symphony? Are their hearts now oriented the same? So when we come together and we worship, if we are all orienting our hearts to worship Jesus Christ, we are coming into harmony And Jesus said, all who can become one, all who come into harmony will experience my presence. You see, if we do not, if half of us are daydreaming, if others of us have um, offenses against each other, if we're in this room not oriented our hearts in the same place, the presence of God does not come. But Jesus said, when my people become one, then my presence will be there manifesting. We want the presence of God. Where the presence of God is, there is the blessing of God. And the same thing happens in a relationship. That the blessing of harmony is, in fact, what we experience as love. It is the blessing that now your eyes no longer see the problems, but you now see the better characteristics and qualities of the people that you're bonded to. That understanding determines much of your relationship. Now, in biblical thought, one more term I'd like to introduce is the word covenant. You've heard it, but there's an aspect of covenant that we type lose through the generations, through the cultural laws, the cultural uh, changes. But the word covenant was a commitment to say, I will keep my heart with you where your heart is. And it was often expressed in, your friends will be my friends, your enemies will be my enemies. I will love what you love. We will become one in heart. That a true covenant, a relational covenant, was we will take our hearts, we will orient them the same direction. Because only if you have your hearts oriented the same direction 
will you experience harmony with the other person. You could be a member of this congregation, and you're bonded, you're committed, but you may have been offended. There's a lot of ways to get offended. Somebody in the congregation said something negative to you, and therefore, you come Sunday after Sunday, but have a wall in your heart. You haven't experienced the harmony. And when you don't experience the harmony, your eyes perceive the errors of the other person rather than perceive the gifts, the strengths, the good aspects. Because the heart either blinds the eyes or opens the eyes. And so you could say, I'm committed, I'm supposed to go to church, I'm supposed to be part of a community, but you haven't experienced that great joy of harmony. Now, for years, I traveled, and my wife, while she was a school teacher, she would be home during the school year. Now, she's always traveled with me in summer times and on breaks when she was not in school, but, but when we were separate, and she was oriented toward the children, she loves teaching school, I love what I get to do, but especially when I was in another country, I'm oriented my heart toward my ministry or toward the people of the nation I'm in. Her heart is oriented toward the children. Now, nothing wrong with that, but the key is when you come back together, you have to reorient your hearts. Because unless you reorient your hearts to the same thing, you won't experience harmony. The bonding doesn't change. That's long term. It builds over years and years and years. But the harmony can change day by day. If your heart's one way, your spouse's heart's another way, you won't experience harmony. And so we would work at, when we come back together, let's get our hearts in the same place. See, this is one of the reasons why in a mixed marriage, where there's children from one marriage preceding, and then you have children for the union, the new union, there has to be a commitment to say, I will love your children the way you love your children. Because unless there is that commitment, the new relationship will never work. They can be bonded, but they'll never experience harmony. And harmony is where the blessing of God is. That's where the presence of love is, and your eyes now see the good rather than the negative. And so there's got to be a commitment to say, I will love what you love. Now, there are ways to help work your way into harmony. Like when we would have a time away, and I'm overseas, and I come back. You can take ways and have ways of lowering the guards of your heart. Like, things you can do, like when you eat with somebody, if it's good food, the guards of your heart go down. Sometimes just sitting across the table enjoying food, yeah, this is good. You start communicating, you start opening up your heart. A process happens, and you're getting closer to coming into harmony. I like to use the, the picture of a tuning fork, because if you take one tuning fork and it's vibrating, Take another tuning fork that's not vibrating, bring it close to the one that's vibrating. Soon, both will be vibrating with the same frequency. You and I are like a tuning fork. When you turn your heart in the same place as another person, you come into harmony with them. If you're all watching the same hockey game, you're gathered around the living room, pretty soon you're all shouting for the same team. Harmony starts happening. This is how God created us. Or into your heart, and you will come into harmony with the person. So if I'm coming back from a trip, my wife and I might go out to eat, and then you start talking, and you usually start talking at the surface levels, but you work down to the more serious things. Usually people talk, and men seem to have the worst time of this. If I come home, and my wife says, what'd you do today? I said, I worked. Okay. Now, that's not what she wants to hear. She wants to hear where my heart went since the last time we talked. I hate that. But I know I'm supposed to do it. And as soon as I share where my heart's been, we'll be back in harmony. It doesn't happen quickly sometimes. Sometimes you've got to work your way down. You've got to relax with each other. You've got to focus on the same thing. You might remember back when years ago, for some of us, when you're dated... Look up at one star together. Pretty soon you got to reach over and grab that hand. Why? Because you're harmonizing on that one star. No, don't you see that star right there? Isn't that cool? Whoa, 
harmony, wong. Learn from this single people, these things work, okay? That when you orient, and now we're coming home, you talk superficial, just you report the facts. But next, when you're going deeper, you usually then talk about the people you saw today. Who'd you see today? Then you usually go one step deeper, and you explain anybody who made you laugh or made you mad today. Now, on a normal get-together, the first evening you come back together, you don't always get down to the deepest levels, but you usually at least get down to somebody you saw today, somebody who you laughed with, something that frustrated you. But then finally, the deepest level is when you're sharing the motivations of your heart. You're saying, well, I guess I did that because I'm insecure. I guess I don't know what God thinks about me. Or I guess I have this area of my life I haven't cleaned up yet. You don't get down to that level very often, but whenever you do with another human being, you're in harmony with them. Things change. Something has happened between you. Or whenever you are so open-hearted that you laugh with all out-of-control laughter, you're back in harmony. And sometimes you miss that with another individual. Now, because of this, we've always been conscious to love what the other person loves. But I've always kind of joked around with my wife about one thing. It's, I was raised in the country. I was raised quite a ways out of the city. And, and where we were raised, we always had big dogs. I like big dogs. That's just how I was raised. But sometimes I'd go home and my wife and I'd walk through town, go shopping, and there'd be some lady with one of these little dogs. Okay, now... I'm sorry if you have one of those little dogs, but I, I don't get it, okay? I never have, okay? Now, I'm sorry. You got to forgive me if you've got a little dog, but just give me a little space here, okay? I don't think they're dogs. I think they're rodents. I, I got a problem here with this, okay? I don't know what they're good for. I, I go fishing with one, be great bait. I mean, I've eaten bigger dogs in some of the countries I go to, okay? So it's been a disconnect for me. Now, some of you, you're already hating me, okay? Because your heart's not going where my heart's going, okay? You got to cut me a little slack here. But my wife, when she sees some lady holding one of those things, would go up, oh, isn't it cute? I'm dying inside. I don't see the cuteness at all. What if sometime I return from a trip, I come home and she's got one of those things? Do you understand my problem? You see how serious this is? I'm in a covenant relationship. I'm supposed to love what she loves. Whoa. This is hard. I can always tell when we're coming back into this unity, this harmony. I come back and... You know, you start talking, as I said, surface things. You're gradually getting down. You're relaxing. You maybe joke a little bit. But I can always tell when she's now coming up closer into harmony with me. She starts doing some of her, what I call, monkey things. Like she reaches across. I'm driving. She'll pluck a hair off my earlobe. Ow! What was that? Okay, that's a good thing, okay? That's a woman marking her territory. She's now taking possession of me again. We're coming back into harmony. There's just something about that where you think, yeah, now back in harmony. But what about this dog? What about this little thing? Oh, I'm worried. But a long time ago, I decided if I come home and she's got one of those, I'll take its little paw grab it, rotate my wrist, touch my heart, say, I have nothing against you. (laughs) Yeah! That's what a marriage commitment is. I will love what you love. You see, if you have a child that's married, if you don't love the spouse of that child the way your your child loves, you will never have harmony with your child anymore. You can't hate their spouse and expect to have a good relationship with your child. No, it didn't work that way. Same thing in the body of Christ. Some people think, well, I love God, but I don't love the church. Can't be done. No, you got to love what God loves to be in harmony with God. You want the Spirit of God on you, you've got to love what He loves, then you're one with Him. 
But if you hate what he loves, you will never have harmony, and there cannot be exchange spirit to spirit. Somehow things get frustrated. And life is all determined by your heart. It's determined by your relationships, it's determined by heart. And you were created by God to have a unity in marriage, a unity in family, a unity in community, and unity with the living God. At the end of your life, when you decide whether you've been a success or not, you will not be looking at how much money you made. You'll be looking at your relationships. You will decide whether you were a success based on your relationships, and those relationships are based on your ability to rule your heart. My ministry is based not on what I know, it's based on my heart. If I allow my heart to get angry at the church because maybe I get hurt, it will come out in my words. If I allow my heart to chase and be swayed away by another woman, that would be a problem. If I get angry, maybe in politics, that will come out of my mouth. If I get angry at a certain culture, that will come out of my heart. But to the more I open up my heart, the more is a love that allows God to flow. Now, I want to bring up my wife here, and we're going to give you a little demonstration in the rest of our time here. But real quickly, we'll show you how we have come to discover harmony can come back. I said we were married, yes, for 41 years, so... Obviously, she was under five when we got married. We're good here. We're good here. It's always scary when she has a microphone. No, we do a lot together. Now, she was a school teacher, as we said, for over 15 years. So let's go back to that time. And each day, she would turn her heart toward the kids, and I'm turning my heart to my ministry, but also my laptop. I love what I do on my laptop. She calls my laptop the other woman, okay? You get the idea? I love my laptop. I love what books I'm writing. I love to get into it. But let's say she's with the children this day. I'm working in my office, doing writing, all that. I love it. Now we're going to come back at the end of the day. Now, if we turn our hearts toward each other, immediately everything's wonderful. And we like to portray it as if we're standing in water and the water is right up to our shoulders. Our heads are above water. When our heads are above water, that's because our hearts are wide open. I can see her. We can communicate. He can hear my words. Honey, will you? And he knows what he, I want him to do, and he, he's already doing it before I've finished my sentence. It's like we can finish each other's sentences. When our heads are above water, when our hearts are open, it's all amazing because wrinkles disappear shining she looking good just something happens when our heads are above water but now we go back another day she's at school she loves the kids i'm doing what i do and i'm writing at the end of the day she comes home and we come back together but let's say this day we don't turn our hearts to each other we try to communicate but it doesn't quite work we're in present in the same room, but we're not really present with one another. I never share below reporting the facts. She's there hoping I will share things, but when she sees I'm not going to share things, she protects her heart. And now our hearts are not turning toward each other, and somehow we start sinking underwater. Then when I say, honey, will you uh, put this in the garage? He takes it to the bathroom. Yes. <laughs> it doesn't matter what she says. I hear it wrong. Actually, I don't hear it wrong. She says it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me you wanted it in the garage? Once we're underwater, everything changed, and oh, communication is hard. So this day, we did not get our hearts open. We go back for another day. I'm working. I'm doing ministry. I'm in the computer going for it, and today we come back together. Now it's like we're underwater, and even to open up the heart is scary. It's like you've now protected it for two days, and you know if you open it up, you might get hurt. So there's something at risk now. And now that you're underwater, communication is hard. It's like garbled. <laughs> 
Why don't you talk clearly to me? <laughs> Last week, it was on the definition of hand. hand Jen handed it to you. Yes. <laughs> what does handed to you mean? Yes. I, Sometimes you can blow out of proportion the littlest thing when you're underwater. Yeah. It didn't work this evening. Nope. Now another third day, I'm working on what I'm working on, and I'm serving God, glory to God. She's feeding the kids. She's with the school. And now we come back to the house. We're underwater. You know, it's easier just to watch the TV and not talk. It's easier for maybe her to go shopping. You need bread in the morning. <laughs> An excuse to go, and I now read the paper, do something, because it's easier to just leave the wall up and be safe. One more day. I'm back doing what I do. She's doing what's with the kids. Her heart's there, my heart's here. We haven't turned our hearts toward each other. It hasn't worked, we're afraid. But now, as we're sinking deeper, we now take a posture, we enter into the relationship that evening in a posture of judgmentalism. I'm in my judgment seat, she's in her judgment seat, and now we're pointing each other's airs. We can see our character flaws. He loves that computer more than he loves me. The computer's nicer than her. It follows your commands. Yes, it <laughs> follows my commands. <laughs> so now we've actually defined what the weakness of the other person is, and we're focusing on it. Now that you have a reason, you have a rationalization, a justification why you should keep your walls up. And why there's no harmony, even though we're still bonded. Still there's bonded. No music playing. We're commuted. There's no music. One more day. Of course, this has never happened to us, okay? We're talking about other people, okay? So if this happened to you, on the fourth day, I'm back, running the computer, doing what I do. We come back together, and now we're already in the judgment seat. We were just finding a characteristic in each other that we really were bothered by. We're, I'm focused on her characteristic flaw. She's focused on my characteristic flaw. You're never climbing my wall. Never going over it. The wall is high. But as you're sinking now, you're getting a little bit muddy in the bottom. Not only do you identify the characteristic, now you start judging the person and you pass sentence. And the first sentence is you evaluate them psychologically. He's obsessed. The reason she does this is because her mother didn't nurse her or something. Something's wrong. <laughs> she is psychologically disturbed. Now, when a couple start analyzing each other psychologically, diagnosing the other person, you're pretty much down pretty deep. Then maybe you might call the pastor for help. Huh? It's usually at that point yeah. where they might ask for help, but they might stay there for a year before they ask for help. I got neighbors that still haven't asked for help. I know. Yeah. So here we go. One more time. I'm doing what I do. She does what she do. We come back together at the end of the day. We're already postured in our judgment seats. And now we're at the very bottom where we judge each other, not just psychologically, but now spiritually. He's possessed. She's a witch. <laughs> Now, again, we've never done this. We're just explaining how these things work. So, now you have to decide how we're going to float back to the top. Yes. And you think it's about going and talking and digging your way out of a hole, but it really isn't no. a good place to do that. The only way to rise to the top is about the heart. I want to come back here someday. Careful. <laughs> These leaves look fuzzy. And I remember when I was little, there was a plant in Mrs. Begg's garden that had fuzzy leaves, too. Do you see what she's doing? We're pointing our heart in the same place. In order to rise up, 
I can no longer point my heart at her problems and her at my problems. We have to find something that we can point at. One thing you can do is you can talk about your children because all of it, all, every parent loves their children. Sometimes it works, sometimes it's not a good subject. But now I got something better because she never did get a lap dog. She got a big dog that acts like a lap dog. <laughs> so yeah. we both love her big lap dog. So my thing that I like to do when we're at the worst of our worst, we go feed the ducks because you can sit and throw out bread and you're famous, quack, 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 quack. They all come up wanting to eat your bread, right? But then you watch the ducks. Oh, did you see that one? Oh, look at that one. And suddenly, that's the most tranquil thing. Yes. Or we can go for a walk in the woods. That's and we cool. point our heart in look, the same place. Look at that tree. You can sit and eat together. Sometimes you go to a movie together. It's okay for Christians to go to movies. Sometimes you just talk about things outside of yourselves in order that you can float back up. And it's just like this life preserver. It's not digging through the hole. It's just like, ooh, it's like special air. What is the air in the balloon? Helium. Helium ooh. taking you up. Oh, yeah. This is how God created us. Heal. It heals you. Helium. Oh, that's if good. you point, it's good. Heal. Yeah, yeah, helium. Yeah, yeah. If you point your hearts in the same place, you'll start rising up. Now, one of the keys that really helped me in this is I realized that when she would be away teaching the kids, I'd be working in my office in the computer, that she would come home and I wanted to finish up what I was writing before I would go say hi. Sometimes it would take 10 minutes, sometimes a half hour. And she's out there hoping I'll come out and talk, and I'm thinking, I want a little bit more time. And you can't look at him either or say words. You can't talk to him. So, because that will make it longer. <laughs> so I'm in here focusing. I'll be out, I'll be out. And I realized one day that every time Linda and I come home, the dog meets us at the door, wagging its tail and happy as it can be. Yeah. And I thought, I should do that for Linda. Because when we would be away, as we'd get closer to home, we'd say, Luther's going to be really excited to see us. Right? We were always looking forward to how excited he would be. Isn't that crazy? But it gave us an idea. You an idea. I was in the computer. <laughs> Every time she would come home the last two years of her school teaching, I would hear the garage door going up as she's coming home. I made a decision. I'm going to meet her at the door like the dog meets me at the door. I made a decision when I hear the garage door, leave the office, leave the computer, run to the door. Hi! I'm so glad you're here! And he did. And it worked. And it worked. And it wasn't just the physical act. It was in the physical act I made a decision. With your heart with her heart to meet her at the door with my heart so we could always stay in harmony. You done? When you're in harmony, everything is good. Done? Yes. <laughs> the quality of your relationships are determined by what's in your heart, not your head. Some of you have experienced yourself going into judgmental mode toward another person. Some of you have diagnosed another person psychologically. How'd that work for you? Some of you have diagnosed a person as far as they're evil. You'll never change them. You'll never solve the problem that way. You have to know I'm going to love what you love. I'm going to open up my heart to you. I'm going to relax in your presence. We're going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to do this with God. I'm going to love what you love. I'm going to do it with my community. I'm not going to be a member of a community where they're all loving something, but I'm sitting in the outer part, committed but not experiencing harmony with them. I'm going to enter in. I'm fully here. This is who I am. I want to experience the best of life. And this is how you do it. I want to just speak a blessing over you. And then Pastor Peter's going to come up here. 
but I want to speak a blessing into your relationships. Would you all stand up? There's always signs and wonders that follow the speaking of the word. Now today, as we speak the word about relationships, you can solve problems that you've had in your relationships. A lot of it comes because you need to forgive somebody today. You got to let it go. Sometimes you think you're going to change them by how hard you hold something against them. That'll never change them. No. You come to a decision one day and say, all I can do is love. So I'm going to love. I'm going to let it go. So Father, we ask for grace in this room to do what you did for us. That you decided to forgive us. You decided to become one with us. You didn't wait for us to straighten out. You came and walked among us. Father, give us the courage today. Give us the grace today and everyone in this room, Lord, to start over. Because each and every one of us want to experience you in our relationships. So we invite you here. We let it go. We ask blessings on relationships and marriage. Blessings on relationships between parents and children. Blessings in the community of saints. Blessings in business. And Father, blessings in our walk with you. Father, we love what you love today. And we thank you for the greatest joy in this world that you give us in relationships. Thank you. We bless you and receive it from you, O oh God. Can everybody say amen? Amen. amen. Pastor Peter.